The Battle of the Coral Sea, from 4 to the 8th of May 1942, was a major naval battle between the Imperial Japanese Navy and naval and air forces of the United States and Australia. Taking place in the Pacific theater of World War II, the battle is historically significant as the first action in which aircraft carriers engaged each other and the first in which the opposing ships neither sighted nor fired directly upon one another. In an attempt to strengthen their defensive position in the South Pacific, the Japanese decided to invade and occupy Port Moresby and Tulagi. The plan, Operation Mo, involved several major units of Japan's combined fleet. They included two fleet carriers and a light carrier to provide air cover for the invasion forces, under the overall command of Admiral Shigeyoshi Ino. The U.S. learned of the Japanese plan through signals intelligence and sent two U.S. Navy carrier task forces and a joint Australian-American cruiser force to oppose the offensive, under the overall command of U.S. Admiral Frank J. Fletcher. On 3-4 May, Japanese forces successfully invaded and occupied Tulagi, although several of their supporting warships were sunk or damaged in surprise attacks by aircraft from the U.S. fleet carrier Yorktown. Now aware of the presence of enemy carriers in the area, the Japanese fleet carriers advanced towards the Coral Sea with the intention of locating and destroying the Allied naval forces. On the evening of 6 May, the two carrier forces came within 70 nautical miles of each other, unbeknownst to anyone. On 7 May, both sides launched airstrikes. Each mistakenly believed they were attacking their opponent's fleet carriers but were actually attacking other units, with the U.S. sinking the Japanese light carrier Shoho and the Japanese sinking a U.S. destroyer and heavily damaging a fleet oiler, which was later scuttled. The next day, each side found and attacked the other's fleet carriers, with the Japanese fleet carrier Shokoku damaged, the U.S. fleet carrier Lexington critically damaged and later scuttled, and Yorktown damaged. With both sides having suffered heavy losses in aircraft and carriers damaged or sunk, the two forces disengaged and retired from the area. Because of the loss of carrier air cover, Inno recalled the Port Moresby invasion fleet with the intention of trying again later. Although a victory for the Japanese in terms of ships sunk, the battle would prove to be a strategic victory for the Allies in several ways. The battle marked the first time since the start of the war that a major Japanese advance had been checked by the Allies. More importantly, the Japanese fleet carriers Shokoku and Zuikoku, the former damaged and the latter with a depleted aircraft complement, were unable to participate in the Battle of Midway the following month, but Yorktown participated on the Allied side, which made for rough parity in aircraft between the adversaries and contributed significantly to the U.S. victory. The severe losses in carriers at Midway prevented the Japanese from re-attempting to invade Port Moresby by sea and helped prompt their ill-fated land offensive over the Kokoda Track. Two months later, the Allies took advantage of Japan's resulting strategic vulnerability in the South Pacific and launched the Guadalcanal Campaign. That and the New Guinea Campaign eventually broke Japanese defenses in the South Pacific and were significant contributors to Japan's ultimate surrender marking the end of World War II. Chapter 1, Background Chapter 1 Section 1, Japanese Expansion On 8 December 1941, Japan declared war on the US and the British Empire, after Japanese forces attacked Malaya, Singapore and Hong Kong as well as the US naval base at Pearl Harbor. In launching this war, Japanese leaders sought to neutralize the US fleet, seize territory rich in natural resources, and obtain strategic military bases to defend their far-flung empire. In the words of the Imperial Japanese Navy Combined Fleet's Secret Order No. 1, dated 1 November 1941, the goals of the initial Japanese campaigns in the impending war were to British and American strength from the Netherlands Indies and the Philippines, to establish a policy of autonomous self-sufficiency and economic independence. To support these goals, during the first few months of 1942, besides Malaya, Japanese forces attacked and successfully took control of the Philippines, Singapore, the Dutch East Indies, Wake Island, New Britain, the Gilbert Islands and Guam, inflicting heavy losses on opposing Allied land, naval and air forces. 
Japan planned to use these conquered territories to establish a perimeter defense for its empire from which it expected to employ attritional tactics to defeat or exhaust any allied counterattacks. Shortly after the war began, Japan's naval general staff recommended an invasion of northern Australia to prevent Australia from being used as a base to threaten Japan's perimeter defenses in the South Pacific. The Imperial Japanese Army rejected the recommendation, stating that it did not have the forces or shipping capacity available to conduct such an operation. At the same time, Vice Admiral Shigeyoshi Ino, commander of the IJN's 4th Fleet which consisted of most of the naval units in the South Pacific area, advocated the occupation of Tilagi in the southeastern Solomon Islands and Port Moresby in New Guinea, which would put northern Australia within range of Japanese land-based aircraft. Ino believed the capture and control of these locations would provide greater security and defensive depth for the major Japanese base at Rabaul on New Britain. The Navy's general staff and the IJ accepted Ino's proposal and promoted further operations, using these locations as supporting bases, to seize New Caledonia, Fiji, and Samoa and thereby cut the supply and communication lines between Australia and the United States. In April 1942, the Army and Navy developed a plan that was titled Operation Mo. The plan called for Port Moresby to be invaded from the sea and secured by the 10th of May. The plan also included the seizure of Tulagi on 2-3 May, where the Navy would establish a seaplane base for potential air operations against Allied territories and forces in the South Pacific and to provide a base for reconnaissance aircraft. Upon the completion of Mo, the Navy planned to initiate Operation Rai, using ships released from Mo, to seize Nauru and Ocean Island for their phosphate deposits on 15 May. Further operations against Fiji, Samoa and New Caledonia were to be planned once Mo and Rai were completed. Because of a damaging air attack by Allied land and carrier-based aircraft on Japanese naval forces invading the Lei Salamua area in New Guinea in March, Ino requested Japan's combined fleet send carriers to provide air cover for Mo. Ino was especially worried about Allied bombers stationed at air bases in Townsville and Cooktown, Australia, beyond the range of his own bombers, based at Rabaul and Lay. Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, commander of the Combined Fleet, was concurrently planning an operation for June, that he hoped would lower the U.S. Navy's carriers, none of which had been damaged in the Pearl Harbor attack, into a decisive showdown in the Central Pacific near Midway Atoll. In the meantime Yamamoto detached some of his large warships, including two fleet carriers, a light carrier, a cruiser division, and two destroyer divisions, to support Mo, and placed Inno in charge of the naval portion of the operation. Chapter 1 Section 2 – Allied Response Unknown to the Japanese, the U.S. Navy, led by the Communication Security Section of the Office of Naval Communications, had for several years enjoyed some success with penetrating Japanese communication ciphers and codes. By March 1942, the U.S. was able to decipher up to 15% of the IJN's row or naval codebook decode, which was used by the IJN for approximately half of its communications. By the end of April, the U.S. was reading up to 85% of the signals broadcast in the row code. In March 1942, the U.S. first noticed mention of the MO operation in intercepted messages. On 5 April, the U.S. intercepted an IJN message directing a carrier and other large warships to proceed to Inno's area of operations. On 13 April, the British deciphered an IJN message informing Inno that the 5th Carrier Division, consisting of the fleet carriers Shokoku and Zuikoku, was en route to his command from Formosa via the main IJN base at Truk. The British passed the message to the U.S., along with their conclusion that Port Moresby was the likely target of Mo Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, the new commander of U.S. forces in the Central Pacific, and his staff discussed the deciphered messages and agreed that the Japanese were likely initiating a major operation in the Southwest Pacific in early May with Port Moresby as the probable target. The Allies regarded Port Moresby as a key base for a planned counteroffensive, under General Douglas MacArthur against Japanese forces in the Southwest Pacific area. Nimitz's staff also concluded that the Japanese operation might include carrier raids on Allied bases in Samoa and at Suva. Nimitz, 
After consultation with Admiral Ernest King, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Fleet, decided to contest the Japanese operation by sending all four of the Pacific Fleet's available aircraft carriers to the Coral Sea. By the 27th of April, further signals intelligence confirmed most of the details and targets of the Mo and Rai plans. On the 29th of April, Nimitz issued orders that sent his four carriers and their supporting warships towards the Coral Sea. Task Force 17, commanded by Rear Admiral Fletcher and consisting of the carrier Yorktown, escorted by three cruisers and four destroyers and supported by a replenishment group of two oilers and two destroyers, was already in the South Pacific, having departed Tongataboo on 27 April en route to the Coral Sea. TF-11, commanded by Rear Admiral Aubrey Fitch and consisting of the carrier Lexington with two cruisers and five destroyers, was between Fiji and New Caledonia. TF-16, commanded by Vice Admiral William F. Halsey and including the carriers Enterprise and Hornet, had just returned to Pearl Harbor from the Doolittle Raid in the Central Pacific. TF-16 immediately departed but would not reach the South Pacific in time to participate in the battle. Nimitz placed Fletcher in command of Allied naval forces in the South Pacific area until Halsey arrived with TF-16. Although the Coral Sea area was under MacArthur's command, Fletcher and Halsey were directed to continue to report to Nimitz while in the Coral Sea area, not to MacArthur. Based on intercepted radio traffic from TF-16 as it returned to Pearl Harbor, the Japanese assumed that all but one of the U.S. Navy's carriers were in the Central Pacific. The Japanese did not know the location of the remaining carrier, but did not expect a U.S. carrier response to Mo until the operation was well underway. Chapter 2 – Battle Chapter 2 – Section 1 – Prelude During late April, the Japanese submarines Row 33 and Row 34 reconnoitred the area where landings were planned. The submarines investigated Russell Island, and the De Boyne Group anchorage in the Louisiade Archipelago, Jomard Channel, and the route to Port Moresby from the east. They did not sight any Allied ships in the area and returned to Rabaul on 23 and the 24th of April respectively. The Japanese Port Moresby invasion force, commanded by Rear Admiral Koso Abe, included 11 transport ships carrying about 5,000 soldiers from the Aegis South Seas Detachment plus approximately 500 troops from the 3rd Kure Special Naval Landing Force. Escorting the transports was the Port Moresby attack force with one light cruiser and six destroyers under the command of Rear Admiral Sadamichi Kajioka. Abe's ships departed Rabaul for the 840 nautical miles trip to Port Moresby on 4 May and were joined by Kajioka's force the next day. The ships, proceeding at eight knots, planned to transit the Jomard Channel in the Louisiades to pass around the southern tip of New Guinea to arrive at Port Moresby by 10 May. The Allied garrison at Port Moresby numbered around 5,333 men, but only half of these were infantry and all were badly equipped and undertrained. Leading the invasion of Tulagi was the Tulagi Invasion Force, commanded by Rear Admiral Kiyohide Shima, consisting of two minilayers, two destroyers, five minesweepers, two subchasers and a transport ship carrying about 400 troops from the 3rd Kure SNLF. Supporting the Tulagi force was the covering group with the light carrier Shoho, four heavy cruisers, and one destroyer, commanded by Rear Admiral Aritomo Gotu. A separate cover force, commanded by Rear Admiral Kuninori Marumo and consisting of two light cruisers, the seaplane tender Kamikawa Maru and three gunboats, joined the covering group in providing distant protection for the Tulagi invasion. Once Tulagi was secured on 3 or the 4th of May, the covering group and cover force were to reposition to help screen the Port Moresby invasion. Ino directed the Mo operation from the cruiser Kashima, with which he arrived at Rabaul from truck on the 4th of May. Goto's force left truck on the 28th of April, cut through the Solomons between Bougainville and Choiseul and took station near New Georgia Island. Marumo's support group sorted from New Ireland on 29 April headed for Thousand Ships Bay, Santa Isabel Island, to establish a seaplane base on 2 May to support the Tulagi assault. Shima's invasion force departed Rabaul on 30 April. The carrier strike force, with the carriers Zuikoku and Shokoku, two heavy cruisers, 
and six destroyers, sorted from truck on the 1st of May. The strike force was commanded by Vice Admiral Takeo Takagi, with Rear Admiral Chuichi Hara, on Zui Koku, in tactical command of the carrier air forces. The carrier strike force was to proceed down the eastern side of the Solomon Islands and enter the Coral Sea south of Guadalcanal. Once in the Coral Sea, the carriers were to provide air cover for the invasion forces, eliminate Allied air power at Port Moresby, and intercept and destroy any Allied naval forces which entered the Coral Sea in response. En route to the Coral Sea, Takagi's carriers were to deliver 90 fighter aircraft to Rabaul. Bad weather during two attempts to make the delivery on 2-3 May compelled the aircraft to return to the carriers, stationed 240 nautical miles from Rabaul, and one of the Zeros was forced to ditch in the sea. In order to try to keep to the Mo timetable, Takagi was forced to abandon the delivery mission after the second attempt and direct his force towards the Solomon Islands to refuel. To give advance warning of the approach of any Allied naval forces, the Japanese sent submarines I-22, I-24, I-28 and I-29 to form a scouting line in the ocean about 450 nautical miles southwest of Guadalcanal. Fletcher's forces had entered the Coral Sea area before the submarines took station, and the Japanese were therefore unaware of their presence. Another submarine, I-21, which was sent to scout around Noumea, was attacked by Yorktown aircraft on 2 May. The submarine took no damage and apparently did not realize that it had been attacked by carrier aircraft. Row 33 and row 34 were also deployed in an attempt to blockade Port Moresby, arriving off the town on 5 May. Neither submarine engaged any ships during the battle. On the morning of 1 May, TF-17 and TF-11 united about 300 nautical miles northwest of New Caledonia. Fletcher immediately detached TF-11 to refuel from the oiler Tippecanoe, while TF-17 refueled from Neosho. TF-17 completed refueling the next day, but TF-11 reported that they would not be finished fueling until 4 May. Fletcher elected to take TF-17 northwest towards the Louisiades and ordered TF-11 to meet TF-44, which was en route from Sydney and Noumea on the 4th of May once refuelling was complete. TF-44 was a joint Australia-US warship force under MacArthur's command, led by Australian Rear Admiral John Crace and made up of the cruisers HMAS Australia, Hobart, and USS Chicago, along with three destroyers. Once it completed refuelling TF-11, Tippecanoe departed the Coral Sea to deliver its remaining fuel to Allied ships at F-8. Chapter 2 Section 2 Tulagi. Early on the 3rd of May, Shima's force arrived off Tulagi and began disembarking the naval troops to occupy the island. Tulagi was undefended, the small garrison of Australian commandos and a Royal Australian Air Force reconnaissance unit evacuated just before Shima's arrival. The Japanese forces immediately began construction of a seaplane and communications base. Aircraft from Shoho covered the landings until early afternoon, when Gotu's force turned towards Bougainville to refuel in preparation to support the landings at Port Moresby. At 1700 hours on 3 May, Fletcher was notified that the Japanese Tulagi invasion force had been sighted the day before, approaching the southern Solomons. Unknown to Fletcher, TF-11 completed refueling that morning ahead of schedule, and was only 60 nautical miles east of TF-17 but was unable to communicate its status because of Fletcher's orders to maintain radio silence. TF-17 changed course and proceeded at 27 knots towards Guadalcanal to launch airstrikes against the Japanese forces at Tulagi the next morning. On 4 May, from a position 100 nautical miles south of Guadalcanal, a total of 60 aircraft from TF-17 launched three consecutive strikes against Shima's forces off Tulagi. Yorktown's aircraft surprised Shima's ships and sank the destroyer Kikazuki and three of the minesweepers, damaged four other ships, and destroyed four seaplanes which were supporting the landings. The U.S. lost one torpedo bomber and two fighters in the strikes, but all of the aircrew were eventually rescued. After recovering its aircraft late in the evening of 4 May, TF-17 retired towards the south.
In spite of the damage suffered in the carrier strikes, the Japanese continued construction of the seaplane base and began flying reconnaissance missions from Tulagi by the 6th of May. Takagi's carrier striking force was refueling 350 nautical miles north of Tulagi when it received word of Fletcher's strike on the 4th of May. Takagi terminated refueling, headed southeast, and sent scout planes to search east of the Solomons, believing that the U.S. carriers were in that area. Since no Allied ships were in that area, the search planes found nothing. Chapter 2 Section 3 – Air Searches and Decisions At 8.16 on 5 May, TF-17 rendezvoused with TF-11 and TF-44 at a predetermined point 320 nautical miles south of Guadalcanal. At about the same time, four Grumman F-4F Wildcat fighters from Yorktown intercepted a Kawanishi H-6K reconnaissance flying boat from the Yokohama Air Group of the 25th Air Flotilla based at the Shortland Islands and shot it down 11 nautical miles from TF-11. The aircraft failed to send a report before it crashed but when it didn't return to base the Japanese correctly assumed that it had been shot down by carrier aircraft. A message from Pearl Harbor notified Fletcher that radio intelligence deduced the Japanese planned to land their troops at Port Moresby on 10 May and their fleet carriers would likely be operating close to the invasion convoy. Armed with this information, Fletcher directed TF-17 to refuel from Neosho. After the refueling was completed on 6 May, he planned to take his forces north towards the Louisiades and do battle on the 7th of May. In the meantime, Takagi's carrier force steamed down the east side of the Solomons throughout the day on the 5th of May, turned west to pass south of San Cristobal, and entered the Coral Sea after transiting between Guadalcanal and Rennell Island in the early morning hours of the 6th of May. Takagi commenced refueling his ships 180 nautical miles west of Tulagi in preparation for the carrier battle he expected would take place the next day. On 6 May, Fletcher absorbed TF 11 and TF 44 into TF 17. Believing the Japanese carriers were still well to the north near Bougainville, Fletcher continued to refuel. Reconnaissance patrols conducted from the U.S. carriers throughout the day failed to locate any of the Japanese naval forces, because they were located just beyond scouting range. At 10 o'clock, a Kawanishi reconnaissance flying boat from Tulagi sighted TF 17 and notified its headquarters. Takagi received the report at 10.50. At that time, Takagi's force was about 300 nautical miles north of Fletcher, near the maximum range for his carrier aircraft. Takagi, whose ships were still refueling, was not yet ready to engage in battle. He concluded, based on the sighting report, TF-17 was heading south and increasing the range. Furthermore, Fletcher's ships were under a large, low-hanging overcast which Takagi and Hara felt would make it difficult for their aircraft to find the U.S. carriers. Takagi detached his two carriers with two destroyers under Hara's command to head towards TF-17 at 20 knots in order to be in position to attack at first light the next day while the rest of his ships completed refueling. U.S. B-17 bombers based in Australia and staging through Port Moresby attacked the approaching Port Moresby invasion forces, including GOTU's warships, several times during the day on 6 May without success. MacArthur's headquarters radioed Fletcher with reports of the attacks and the locations of the Japanese invasion forces. MacArthur's flyers reports of seeing a carrier about 425 nautical miles northwest of TF-17 further convinced Fletcher fleet carriers were accompanying the invasion force. At 1800 hours, TF-17 completed fueling and Fletcher detached Neosho with a destroyer, Sims, to take station further south at a prearranged rendezvous. TF-17 then turned to head northwest, towards Russell Island in the Louisiades. Unbeknownst to the two adversaries, their carriers were only 70 nautical miles away from each other by 20 hundred hours that night. At 20 hundred hours, Hara reversed course to meet Takagi, completed refueling and was now heading in Hara's direction. Late on the 6th of May or early on the 7th of May, Kamikawa Maru set up a seaplane base in the Des Moines Islands in order to help provide air support for the invasion forces as they approached Port Moresby.
The rest of Marumo's cover force then took station near the Dontracasto Islands to help screen Abe's oncoming convoy. Chapter 2 Section 4, Carrier Battle, First Day Chapter 2 Section 4 Subsection 2 Morning Strikes At 6.25 on 7 May, TF-17 was 115 nautical miles south of Russell Island. At this time, Fletcher sent Crace's cruiser force, now designated Task Group 17.3, to block the Jomard Passage. Fletcher understood that Crace would be operating without air cover since TF-17's carriers would be busy trying to locate and attack the Japanese carriers. Detaching Crace reduced the anti-aircraft defenses for Fletcher's carriers. Nevertheless, Fletcher decided the risk was necessary to ensure the Japanese invasion forces could not slip through to Port Moresby while he engaged the carriers. Believing Takagi's carrier force was somewhere north of him, in the vicinity of the Louisiades, beginning at 619, Fletcher directed Yorktown to send 10 Douglas SBD Dauntless dive bombers as scouts to search that area. Hara in turn believed Fletcher was south of him and advised Takagi to send the aircraft to search that area. Takagi, approximately 300 nautical miles east of Fletcher, launched 12 Nakajima B-5NS at 6 o'clock to scout for TF-17. Around the same time, Goto's cruisers Kinugasa and Furtaka launched four Kawanishi E-7 K-2 Type 94 floatplanes to search southeast of the Louisiades. Augmenting their search were several floatplanes from Des Moines, four Kawanishi H-6Ks from Tulagi, and three Mitsubishi G-4M bombers from Robaul. Each side readied the rest of its carrier attack aircraft to launch immediately once the enemy was located. At 7.22 one of Takagi's carrier scouts, from Shokoku, reported U.S. ships bearing 182 degrees, 163 nautical miles from Takagi. At 7.45, the scout confirmed that it had located one carrier, one cruiser, and three destroyers. Another Shokoku scout aircraft quickly confirmed the sighting. The Shokoku aircraft actually sighted and misidentified the Euler Neosho, and destroyer Sims, which had earlier been detailed away from the fleet to a southern rendezvous point. Believing that he had located the U.S. carriers, Hara, with Takagi's concurrence, immediately launched all of his available aircraft. A total of 78 aircraft, 18 Zero fighters, 36 Ichida dive bombers, and 24 torpedo aircraft, began launching from Shokoku and Zuikoku at 8 o'clock and were on their way by 8.15 towards the reported sighting. The strike force was under overall command of Lt. Commander Kakuchi Takahashi, while Lt. Commander Shigekazu Shimazaki led its torpedo bombers. At 8.20, one of the Furtaka aircraft found Fletcher's carriers and immediately reported it to Inno's headquarters at Rabaul, which passed the report on to Takagi. The sighting was confirmed by a Kinugasa floatplane at 8.30. Takagi and Hara, confused by the conflicting sighting reports they were receiving, decided to continue with the strike on the ships to their south, but turned their carriers towards the northwest to close the distance with Furtaka's reported contact. Takagi and Hara considered that the conflicting reports might mean that the U.S. carrier forces were operating in two separate groups. At 8.15, a Yorktown SBD piloted by John L. Nielsen sighted Goto's force, screening the invasion convoy. Nielsen, making an error in his coded message, reported the sighting as two carriers and four heavy cruisers at 10 degrees 3 s 152 degrees 27 e. 225 nautical miles northwest of TF-17. Fletcher concluded that the Japanese main carrier force was located and ordered the launch of all available carrier aircraft to attack. By 10.13, the U.S. strike of 93 aircraft, 18 Grumman F-4F Wildcats, 53 Douglas SBD Dauntless dive bombers, and 22 Douglas TBD Devastator torpedo bombers, was on its way. At 10.19, Nielsen landed and discovered his coding error. Although Goto's force included the light carrier Shoho, Nielsen thought that he saw two cruisers and four destroyers and thus the main fleet. At 10.12, Fletcher received a report of an aircraft carrier, 10 transports, 
and 16 warships 30 nautical miles south of Nielsen's sighting at 10 degrees 35 s 152 degrees 36 e. The B-17s actually saw the same thing as Nielsen, Shoho, Gotu's cruisers, plus the Port Moresby invasion force. Believing that the B-17's sighting was the main Japanese carrier force, Fletcher directed the airborne strike force towards this target. At 9.15, Takahashi's strike force reached its target area, sighted Neosho and Sims, and searched in vain for the U.S. carriers for a couple of hours. Finally, at 10.51 Shokoku scout aircrews realized they were mistaken in their identification of the oiler and destroyer as aircraft carriers. Takagi now realized the U.S. carriers were between him and the invasion convoy, placing the invasion forces in extreme danger. At 11.15, the torpedo bombers and fighters abandoned the mission and headed back towards the carriers with their ordnance, while the 36 dive bombers attacked the two U.S. ships. Four dive bombers attacked Sims and the rest dived on Neosho. The destroyer was hit by three bombs, broke in half, and sank immediately, killing all but 14 of her 192-man crew. Neosho was hit by seven bombs. One of the dive bombers, hit by anti-aircraft fire, crashed into the oiler. Heavily damaged and without power, Neosho was left drifting and slowly sinking. Before losing power, Neosho was able to notify Fletcher by radio that she was under attack and in trouble, but garbled any further details as to just who or what was attacking her and gave wrong coordinates for its position. The U.S. strike aircraft sighted Shoho a short distance northeast of Misima Island at 10.40 and deployed to attack. The Japanese carrier was protected by six Zeros and two Mitsubishi A5M fighters flying combat air patrol, as the rest of the carrier's aircraft were being prepared below decks for a strike against the U.S. carriers. Gotu's cruisers surrounded the carrier in a diamond formation, 3,000 to 5,000 yards off each of Shoho's corners. Attacking first, Lexington's air group, led by Commander William B. Alt, hit Shoho with two 1,000 pounds bombs and five torpedoes, causing severe damage. At 11 o'clock, Yorktown's air group attacked the burning and now almost stationary carrier, scoring with up to 11 more 1,000 pounds bombs and at least two torpedoes. Torn apart, Shoho sank at 11.35. Fearing more air attacks, Gotu withdrew his warships to the north, but sent the destroyer Sozanami back at 1400 hours to rescue survivors. Only 203 of the carrier's 834-man crew were recovered. Three U.S. aircraft were lost in the attack, two SPDs from Lexington and one from Yorktown. All of Shoho's aircraft complement of 18 was lost, but three of the Cap fighter pilots were able to ditch at Deboyne and survived. At 12.10, using a prearranged message to signal TF-17 on the success of the mission, Lexington SPD pilot and squadron commander Robert E. Dixon radioed Scratch 1 flat top. Signed Bob. Chapter 2 Section 4 Subsection 3 Afternoon Operations The U.S. aircraft returned and landed on their carriers by 1338. By 1420, the aircraft were rearmed and ready to launch against the Port Moresby invasion force or go-to's cruisers. Fletcher was concerned that the locations of the rest of the Japanese fleet carriers were still unknown. He was informed that Allied intelligence sources believed that up to four Japanese carriers might be supporting the MO operation. Fletcher concluded that by the time his scout aircraft found the remaining carriers it would be too late in the day to mount a strike. Thus, Fletcher decided to hold off on another strike this day and remain concealed under the thick overcast with fighters ready in defense. Fletcher turned TF-17 southwest, dot apprised of the loss of Shoho, Ino ordered the invasion convoy to temporarily withdraw to the north and ordered Takagi, at this time located 225 nautical miles east of TF-17, to destroy the U.S. carrier forces. As the invasion convoy reversed course, it was bombed by eight U.S. Army B-17s, but was not damaged. Gotu and Kajioka were told to assemble their ships south of Russell Island for a night surface battle if the U.S. ships came within range. At 1240, 
a Des Moines-based seaplane sighted and reported Crace's detached cruiser and destroyer force on a bearing of 175 degrees, 78 nautical miles from Des Moines. At 13.15, an aircraft from Rabaul sighted Crace's force but submitted an erroneous report, stating the force contained two carriers and was located, bearing 205 degrees, 115 nautical miles from Des Moines. Based on these reports, Takagi, who was still awaiting the return of all of his aircraft from attacking Neosho, turned his carriers due west at 13.30 and advised Inno at 1500 hours that the U.S. carriers were at least 430 nautical miles west of his location and that he would therefore be unable to attack them that day. Inno's staff directed two groups of attack aircraft from Rabaul, already airborne since that morning, towards Crace's reported position. The first group included 12 torpedo-armed G-4M bombers and the second group comprised 19 Mitsubishi Gem land attack aircraft armed with bombs. Both groups found and attacked Crace's ships at 1430 and claimed to have sunk a California-type battleship and damaged another battleship and cruiser. In reality, Crace's ships were undamaged and shot down four G-4MS. A short time later, Three U.S. Army B-17s mistakenly bombed Crace, but caused no damage. Crace at 1526 radioed Fletcher, he could not complete his mission without air support. Crace retired southward to a position about 220 nautical miles northeast of Port Moresby to increase the range from Japanese carrier or land-based aircraft while remaining close enough to intercept any Japanese naval forces advancing beyond the Louisiades through either the Jomard Passage or the China Strait. Crace's ships were low on fuel, and as Fletcher was maintaining radio silence, Crace had no idea of Fletcher's location, status, or intentions. Shortly after 1500 hours, Zuikoku monitored a message from a Des Moines based reconnaissance aircraft reporting Crace's force altered course to 120 degrees true. Takagi's staff assumed the aircraft was shadowing Fletcher's carriers and determined if the Allied ships held that course, they would be within striking range shortly before nightfall. Takagi and Hara were determined to attack immediately with a select group of aircraft minus fighter escort, even though it meant the strike would return after dark dock to try to confirm the location of the U.S. carriers, at 15.15 Hara sent a flight of eight torpedo bombers as scouts to sweep 200 nautical miles westward. About that same time, the dive bombers that had attacked Neosho returned and landed. Six of the weary dive bomber pilots were told they would be immediately departing on another mission. Choosing his most experienced crews, including Takahashi, Shimazaki, and Lieutenant Teimotsu Emma, at 1615 Hara launched 12 dive bombers and 15 torpedo planes with orders to fly on a heading of 277 degrees to 280 nautical miles. The eight scout aircraft reached the end of their 200 nautical miles urch leg and turned back without seeing Fletcher's ships. At 1747, TF-17, operating under thick overcast, 200 nautical miles west of Takagi, detected the Japanese strike on radar heading in their direction, turned southeast into the wind, and vectored 11 Cap Wildcats, led by Lieutenant Commanders Paul H. Ramsey and James H. Flatley, to intercept. Taking the Japanese formation by surprise, the Wildcats shot down seven torpedo bombers and one dive bomber, and heavily damaged another torpedo bomber, at a cost of three Wildcats lost. Having taken heavy losses in the attack, which also scattered their formations, the Japanese strike leaders cancelled the mission after conferring by radio. The Japanese aircraft all jettisoned their ordnance and reversed course to return to their carriers. The sun set at 18.30. Several of the Japanese dive bombers encountered the U.S. carriers in the darkness, around 1900 hours, and briefly confused as to their identity, circled in preparation for landing before anti-aircraft fire from TF-17's destroyers drove them away. By 20 hundred hours, TF-17 and Takagi were about 100 nautical miles apart. Takagi turned on his warship's searchlights to help guide the 18 surviving aircraft back and all were recovered by 22 colon dot in the meantime, at 1518 and 1718 Neosho, was able to radio TF-17 she was drifting northwest in a sinking condition.
Neosho's 1718 report gave wrong coordinates, which hampered subsequent U.S. rescue efforts to locate the oiler. More significantly, the news informed Fletcher his only nearby available fuel supply was gone. As nightfall ended aircraft operations for the day, Fletcher ordered TF-17 to head west and prepared to launch a 360 degrees search at first light. Crace also turned west, to stay within striking range of the Louisiades. Ino directed Takagi to make sure he destroyed the U.S. carriers the next day, and postponed the Port Moresby landings to the 12th of May. Takagi elected to take his carriers 120 nautical miles north during the night so he could concentrate his morning search to the west and south and ensure that his carriers could provide better protection for the invasion convoy. Gotu and Kajioka were unable to position and coordinate their ships in time to attempt a night attack on the Allied warship stock both sides expected to find each other early the next day, and spent the night preparing their strike aircraft for the anticipated battle as their exhausted aircrews attempted to get a few hours sleep. In 1972, U.S. Vice Admiral H.S. Duckworth, after reading Japanese records of the battle, commented, without a doubt, May 7, 1942, vicinity of Coral Sea, was the most confused battle area in world history. Hara later told Yamamoto's chief of staff, Admiral Motome Agaki, he was so frustrated with the poor luck the Japanese experienced on the 7th of May that he felt like quitting the Navy. Chapter 2 Section 5, Carrier Battle, Second Day Chapter 2 Section 5 Subsection 2 Attack on the Japanese Carriers at 6.15 on 8 May, from a position 100 nautical miles east of Russell Island, Hara launched seven torpedo bombers to search the area bearing 140 to 230 degrees, out to 250 nautical miles from the Japanese carriers. Assisting in the search were three Kaonishi H-6Ks from Tulagi and four G-4M bombers from Rabaul. At 7 o'clock, the carrier striking force turned to the southwest and was joined by two of Gotu's cruisers, Kinugasa and Furtaka, for additional screening support. The invasion convoy, Gotu, and Kajioka steered towards a rendezvous point 40 nautical miles east of Woodlark Island to await the outcome of the carrier battle. During the night, the warm frontal zone with low clouds which had helped hide the U.S. carriers on the 7th of May moved north and east and now covered the Japanese carriers, limiting visibility to between 2 and 15 nautical miles. At 6.35, TF-17, operating under Fitch's tactical control and positioned 180 nautical miles southeast of the Louisiades, launched 18 SPDs to conduct a 360 degrees, search out to 200 nautical miles. The skies over the U.S. carriers were mostly clear, with 17 nautical miles visibility. At 820, a Lexington SPD piloted by Joseph G. Smith spotted the Japanese carriers through a hole in the clouds and notified TF-17. Two minutes later, a Shokoku search plane commanded by Kenzo Kano sighted TF-17 and notified Hara. The two forces were about 210 nautical miles apart. Both sides raced to launch their strike aircraft. At 9.15, the Japanese carriers launched a combined strike of 18 fighters, 33 dive bombers, and 18 torpedo planes, commanded by Takahashi, with Shimazaki again leading the torpedo bombers. The U.S. carriers each launched a separate strike. Yorktown's group consisted of six fighters, 24 dive bombers, and nine torpedo planes and was on its way by 9.15. Lexington's group of nine fighters, 15 dive bombers, and 12 torpedo planes was off at 9.25. Both the U.S. and Japanese carrier warship forces turned to head directly for each other's location at high speed in order to shorten the distance their aircraft would have to fly on their return legs. Yorktown's dive bombers, led by William O. Birch, reached the Japanese carriers at 10.32, and paused to allow the slower torpedo squadron to arrive so that they could conduct a simultaneous attack. At this time, Shokoku and Zuikoku were about 10,000 yards apart, with Zuikoku hidden under a rain squall of low-hanging clouds. The two carriers were protected by 16 Cap-Zero fighters, 
The Yorktown dive bombers commenced their attacks at 10.57 on Shokoku and hit the radically maneuvering carrier with two 1,000 pounds bombs, tearing open the forecastle and causing heavy damage to the carrier's flight and hangar decks. The Yorktown torpedo planes missed with all of their ordnance. Two U.S. dive bombers and two Cap Zeros were shot down during the attack. Lexington's aircraft arrived and attacked at 11.30. Two dive bombers attacked Shokoku, hitting the carrier with one 1,000 pounds bomb, causing further damage. Two other dive bombers dove on Zuikoku, missing with their bombs. The rest of Lexington's dive bombers were unable to find the Japanese carriers in the heavy clouds. Lexington's TBDs missed Shokoku with all 11 of their torpedoes. The 13 Cap Zeros on patrol at this time shot down three Wildcats. With her flight deck heavily damaged and 223 of her crew killed or wounded, having also suffered explosions in her gasoline storage tanks and an engine repair workshop destroyed, Shokoku was unable to conduct further aircraft operations. Her captain, Takatsugu Jojima, requested permission from Takagi and Hara to withdraw from the battle, to which Takagi agreed. At 12.10, Shokoku, accompanied by two destroyers, retired to the northeast. Chapter 2 Section 5 Subsection 3 Attack on the U.S. Carriers At 10.55, Lexington's Ktam-1 radar detected the inbound Japanese aircraft at a range of 68 nautical miles and vectored nine Wildcats to intercept. Expecting the Japanese torpedo bombers to be at a much lower altitude than they actually were, six of the Wildcats were stationed too low, and thus missed the Japanese aircraft as they passed by overhead. Because of the heavy losses in aircraft suffered the night before, the Japanese could not execute a full torpedo attack on both carriers. Lieutenant Commander Shigekazu Shimazaki, commanding the Japanese torpedo planes, sent 14 to attack Lexington and 4 to attack Yorktown. A Wildcat shot down one and patrolling SBDs destroyed three more as the Japanese torpedo planes descended to take attack position. In return, escorting Zeros shot down four Yorktown SBDs. One of the survivors, Swede Vegtasa, claimed three Zeros during the onslaught. The Japanese attack began at 11.13 as the carriers, stationed 3,000 yards apart, and their escorts opened fire with anti-aircraft guns. The four torpedo planes which attacked Yorktown all missed. The remaining torpedo planes successfully employed a pincer attack on Lexington, which had a much larger turning radius than Yorktown, and, at 11.20, hit her with two Type 91 torpedoes. The first torpedo buckled the Port Aviation gasoline stowage tanks. Undetected, gasoline vapors spread into surrounding compartments. The second torpedo ruptured the port water main, reducing water pressure to the three forward fire rooms and forcing the associated boilers to be shut down. The ship could still make 24 knots with her remaining boilers. Four of the Japanese torpedo planes were shot down by anti-aircraft fire. The 33 Japanese dive bombers circled to attack from upwind, and thus did not begin their dives from 14,000 feet until three to four minutes after the torpedo planes began their attacks. The 19 Shokoku dive bombers, under Takahashi, lined up on Lexington while the remaining 14, directed by Teimotsu Emma, targeted Yorktown. Escorting Zeros shielded Takahashi's aircraft from four Lexington Cap Wildcats which attempted to intervene, but two Wildcats circling above Yorktown were able to disrupt Emma's formation. Takahashi's bombers damaged Lexington with two bomb hits and several near misses, causing fires which were contained by 1233. At 1127, Yorktown was hit in the center of her flight deck by a single 250 kg, semi-armor-piercing bomb which penetrated four decks before exploding, causing severe structural damage to an aviation storage room and killing or seriously wounding 66 men, as well as damaging the superheater boilers which rendered them inoperable. Up to 12 near misses damaged Yorktown's hull below the waterline. Two of the dive bombers were shot down by a Cap Wildcat during the attack. As the Japanese aircraft completed their attacks and began to withdraw, 
believing that they inflicted fatal damage to both carriers, they ran a gauntlet of Cap Wildcats and SPDs. In the ensuing aerial duels, three SPDs and three Wildcats for the US, and three torpedo bombers, one dive bomber, and one zero for the Japanese were downed. By 12 o'clock, the US and Japanese strike groups were on their way back to their respective carriers. During their return, aircraft from the two adversaries passed each other in the air, resulting in more air-to-air -air altercations. Kano's and Takahashi's aircraft were shot down, killing both of them. Chapter 2 Section 5 Subsection 4 Recovery, Reassessment and Retreat The strike forces, with many damaged aircraft, reached and landed on their respective carriers between 12.50 and 14.30. In spite of damage, Yorktown and Lexington were both able to recover aircraft from their returning air groups. During recovery operations, for various reasons the US lost an additional five SPDs, two TBDs, and a Wildcat, and the Japanese lost two Zeros, five dive bombers, and one torpedo plane. 46 of the original 69 aircraft from the Japanese strike force returned from the mission and landed on Zuikoku. Of these, three more Zeros, four dive bombers and five torpedo planes were judged damaged beyond repair and were immediately jettisoned into the sea. As TF-17 recovered its aircraft, Fletcher assessed the situation. The returning aviators reported they heavily damaged one carrier, but that another had escaped damage. Fletcher noted that both his carriers were hurt and that his air groups had suffered high fighter losses. Fuel was also a concern due to the loss of Neosho. At 1422, Fitch notified Fletcher that he had reports of two undamaged Japanese carriers and that this was supported by radio intercepts. Believing that he faced overwhelming Japanese carrier superiority, Fletcher elected to withdraw TF-17 from the battle. Fletcher radioed MacArthur the approximate position of the Japanese carriers and suggested that he attack with his land-based bombers. Around 1430, Hara informed Takagi that only 24 Zeros, 8 dive bombers, and 4 torpedo planes from the carriers were currently operational. Takagi was worried about his ship's fuel levels, his cruisers were at 50% and some of his destroyers were as low as 20%. At 1500 hours, Takagi notified Inno his flyers had sunk two U.S. carriers, Yorktown and a Saratoga class, but heavy losses in aircraft meant he could not continue to provide air cover for the invasion. Inno, whose reconnaissance aircraft sighted Crace's ships earlier that day, recalled the invasion convoy to Rabaul, postponed Mo to the 3rd of July, and ordered his forces to assemble northeast of the Solomons to begin the Rai operation. Zui Koku and her escorts turned towards Rabaul while Shokoku headed for Japan. Aboard Lexington, damage control parties put out the fires and restored her to operational condition, but at 12.47, sparks from unattended electric motors ignited gasoline fumes near the ship's central control station. The resulting explosion killed 25 men and started a large fire. Around 14.42, another large explosion occurred, starting a second severe fire. A third explosion occurred at 15.25 and at 15.38 the ship's crew reported the fires as uncontrollable. Lexington's crew began abandoning ship at 17.07. After the carrier's survivors were rescued, including Admiral Fitch and the ship's captain, Frederick C. Sherman, at 19.15 the destroyer Phelps fired five torpedoes into the burning ship, which sank in 2,400 fathoms at 1952. 216 of the carrier's 2,951 man crew went down with the ship, along with 36 aircraft. Phelps and the other assisting warships left immediately to rejoin Yorktown and her escorts, which departed at 1601, and TF-17 retired to the southwest. Later that evening, MacArthur informed Fletcher that eight of his B-17s had attacked the invasion convoy and that it was retiring to the northwest. That evening, Crace detached Hobart, which was critically low on fuel, and the destroyer Walk, which was having engine trouble, to proceed to Townsville. Crace overheard radio reports saying the enemy invasion convoy had turned back, but, 
unaware Fletcher had withdrawn, he remained on patrol with the rest of TG-17.3 in the Coral Sea in case the Japanese invasion force resumed its advance towards Port Moresby. Chapter 3, Aftermath On the 9th of May, TF-17 altered course to the east and proceeded out of the Coral Sea via a route south of New Caledonia. Nimitz ordered Fletcher to return Yorktown to Pearl Harbor as soon as possible after refueling at Tongataboo. During the day, U.S. Army bombers attacked Duboin and Kamikawa Maru, inflicting unknown damage. In the meantime, having heard nothing from Fletcher, Crace deduced that TF-17 had departed the area. At one o'clock on the 10th of May, hearing no further reports of Japanese ships advancing towards Port Moresby, Crace turned towards Australia and arrived at Sid Harbour, 130 nautical miles south of Townsville, on the 11th of May. At 2200 hours on the 8th of May, Yamamoto ordered Inno to turn his forces around, destroy the remaining Allied warships, and complete the invasion of Port Moresby. Inno did not cancel the recall of the invasion convoy, but ordered Takagi and Gotu to pursue the remaining Allied warship forces in the Coral Sea. Critically low on fuel, Takagi's warships spent most of the 9th of May refueling from the fleet oiler Toho Maru. Late in the evening of the 9th of May, Takagi and Gotu headed southeast, then southwest into the Coral Sea. Seaplanes from Duboin assisted Takagi in searching for TF-17 on the morning of the 10th of May. Fletcher and Crace were already well on their way out of the area. At 1300 hours on the 10th of May, Takagi concluded that the enemy was gone and decided to turn back towards Rabaul. Yamamoto concurred with Takagi's decision and ordered Zuikoku to return to Japan to replenish her air groups. At the same time, Kamikawa Maru packed up and departed Duboin. At noon on the 11th of May, a U.S. Navy PBY on patrol from Noumea sighted the drifting Neosho. The U.S. destroyer Henley responded and rescued 109 Neosho and 14 SIM survivors later that day, then scuttled the tanker with gunfire. On the 10th of May, Operation Rai commenced. After the operation's flagship, Minilea Okinoshima, was sunk by the U.S. submarine S-42 on the 12th of May, the landings were postponed until 17 May. In the meantime, Halsey's TF-16 reached the South Pacific near F-8 and, on the 13th of May, headed north to contest the Japanese approach to Nauru and Ocean Island. On the 14th of May, Nimitz, having obtained intelligence concerning the combined fleet's upcoming operation against Midway, ordered Halsey to make sure that Japanese scout aircraft sighted his ships the next day, after which he was to return to Pearl Harbor immediately. At 10.15 on the 15th of May, a Kawanishi reconnaissance aircraft from Tulagi sighted TF-16 plus 445 nautical mile east of the Solomons. Halsey's feint worked. Fearing a carrier air attack on his exposed invasion forces, Ino immediately cancelled Rai and ordered his ships back to Rabaul and Truck. On the 19th of May, TF-16, which returned to the F-8 area to refuel, turned towards Pearl Harbor and arrived there on the 26th of May. Yorktown reached Pearl the following day. Shokoku reached Kure, Japan, on the 17th of May, almost capsizing en route during a storm due to her battle damage. Zuikoku arrived at Kure on the 21st of May, having made a brief stop at Truck on the 15th of May. Acting on signals intelligence, the U.S. placed eight submarines along the projected route of the carrier's return paths to Japan, but the submarines were not able to make any attacks. Japan's naval general staff estimated that it would take two to three months to repair Shokoku and replenish the carrier's air groups. Thus, both carriers would be unable to participate in Yamamoto's upcoming midway operation. The two carriers rejoined the combined fleet on 14 July and were key participants in subsequent carrier battles against U.S. forces. The 5I-class submarines supporting the MO operation were retasked to support an attack on Sydney Harbour three weeks later as part of a campaign to disrupt Allied supply lines. En route to truck the submarine I-28 was torpedoed on 17 May by the U.S. submarine to Torg and sank with all hands. Chapter 4, Significance 
Both sides publicly claimed victory after the battle. In terms of ships lost, the Japanese won a tactical victory by sinking a U.S. fleet carrier, an oiler, and a destroyer, 41,826 long tons, versus a light carrier, a destroyer, and several smaller warships, 19,000 long tons, sunk by the U.S. side. Lexington represented, at that time, 25% of U.S. carrier strength in the Pacific. The Japanese public was informed of the victory with overstatement of the U.S. damage and understatement of their own. From a strategic perspective, however, the battle was an allied victory as it averted the seaborne invasion of Port Moresby, lessening the threat to the supply lines between the U.S. and Australia. Although the withdrawal of Yorktown from the Coral Sea conceded the field, the Japanese were forced to abandon the operation that had initiated the Battle of the Coral Sea in the first place. The battle marked the first time that a Japanese invasion force was turned back without achieving its objective, which greatly lifted the morale of the Allies after a series of defeats by the Japanese during the initial six months of the Pacific Theater. Port Moresby was vital to Allied strategy and Ed's garrison could well have been overwhelmed by the experienced Japanese invasion troops. The U.S. Navy also exaggerated the damage it inflicted, which was to cause the press to treat its reports of Midway with more caution. The results of the battle had a substantial effect on the strategic planning of both sides. Without a hold in New Guinea, the subsequent Allied advance, arduous as it was, would have been even more difficult. For the Japanese, who focused on the tactical results, the battle was seen as merely a temporary setback. The results of the battle confirmed the low opinion held by the Japanese of U.S. fighting capability and supported their overconfident belief that future carrier operations against the U.S. were assured of success. Chapter 4 Section 1 Midway One of the most significant effects of the Coral Sea battle was the loss of Shokoku and Zuikoku to Yamamoto for his planned battle in the air with the U.S. carriers at Midway. The Japanese believed that they sank two carriers in the Coral Sea, but this still left at least two more U.S. Navy carriers, Enterprise and Hornet, which could help defend Midway. The aircraft complement of the U.S. carriers was larger than that of their Japanese counterparts, which, when combined with the land-based aircraft at Midway, meant that the combined fleet no longer enjoyed a significant numerical aircraft superiority over the U.S. Navy for the impending battle. In fact, the U.S. would have three carriers to oppose Yamamoto at Midway, because, despite the damage the ship suffered during the Coral Sea battle, Yorktown was able to return to Hawaii. Although estimates were that the damage would take two weeks to repair, Yorktown put to sea only 48 hours after entering dry dock at Pearl Harbor, which meant that she was available for the next confrontation with the Japanese. At Midway, Yorktown's aircraft played crucial roles in sinking two Japanese fleet carriers. Yorktown also absorbed both Japanese aerial counterattacks at Midway which otherwise would have been directed at Enterprise and Hornet. In contrast to the strenuous efforts by the U.S. to employ the maximum forces available for Midway, the Japanese apparently did not even consider trying to include Zuikoku in the operation. No effort appears to have been made to combine the surviving Shokoku aircrews with Zuikoku's air groups or to quickly provide Zuikoku with replacement aircraft, so she could participate with the rest of the combined fleet at Midway. Shokoku herself was unable to conduct further aircraft operations, with her flight deck heavily damaged, and she required almost three months of repair in Japan. Historians H.P. Wilmot, Jonathan Parshall, and Anthony Tully believe Yamamoto made a significant strategic error in his decision to support Operation Mo with strategic assets. Since Yamamoto had decided the decisive battle with the U.S. was to take place at Midway, he should not have diverted any of his important assets, especially fleet carriers, to a secondary operation like Mo. Yamamoto's decision meant Japanese naval forces were weakened just enough at both the Coral Sea and Midway battles to allow the Allies to defeat them in detail. Wilmot adds, if either operation was important enough to commit fleet carriers, then all of the Japanese carriers should have been committed to each in order to ensure success. By committing crucial assets to Mo, 
Yamamoto made the more important midway operation dependent on the secondary operation's success. Moreover, Yamamoto apparently missed the other implications of the Coral Sea battle, the unexpected appearance of U.S. carriers in exactly the right place and time to effectively contest the Japanese, and U.S. Navy carrier aircrews demonstrating sufficient skill and determination to do significant damage to the Japanese carrier forces. These would be repeated at Midway, for the same reason, and as a result, Japan lost four fleet carriers, the core of her naval offensive forces, and thereby lost the strategic initiative in the Pacific War. Partial and Tully point out that, due to U.S. industrial strength, once Japan lost its numerical superiority in carrier forces as a result of Midway, Japan could never regain it. Partial and Tully add, the Battle of the Coral Sea had provided the first hints that the Japanese high-water mark had been reached, but it was the Battle of Midway that put up the sign for all to see. Chapter 4 Section 2 Situation in the South Pacific the Australians and U.S. forces in Australia were initially disappointed with the outcome of the Battle of the Coral Sea, fearing the MO operation was the precursor to an invasion of the Australian mainland, and the setback to Japan was only temporary. In a meeting held in late May, the Australian Advisory War Council described the battle's result as rather disappointing given that the Allies had advance notice of Japanese intentions. General MacArthur provided Australian Prime Minister John Curtin with his assessment of the battle, stating that all the elements that have produced disaster in the Western Pacific since the beginning of the war were still present as Japanese forces could strike anywhere if supported by major elements of the IJN. Because of the severe losses in carriers at Midway, the Japanese were unable to support another attempt to invade Port Moresby from the sea, forcing Japan to try to take Port Moresby by land. Japan began its land offensive towards Port Moresby along the Kokoda Track on 21 July from Buna and Ghana. By then, the Allies had reinforced New Guinea with additional troops, starting with the Australian 14th Brigade which embarked at Townsville on 15 May. The added forces slowed, then eventually halted the Japanese advance towards Port Moresby in September 1942, and defeated an attempt by the Japanese to overpower an Allied base at Milne Bay. In the meantime, the Allies learned in July that the Japanese had begun building an airfield on Guadalcanal. Operating from this base the Japanese would threaten the shipping supply routes to Australia. To prevent this from occurring, the US chose Tulagi and nearby Guadalcanal, as the target of their first offensive. The failure of the Japanese to take Port Moresby, and their defeat at Midway, had the effect of dangling their base at Tulagi and Guadalcanal without effective protection from other Japanese bases. Tulagi and Guadalcanal were four hours flying time from Rabaul, the nearest large Japanese base. Three months later, on 7 August 1942, 11,000 United States Marines landed on Guadalcanal, and 3,000 U.S. Marines landed on Tulagi and nearby islands. The Japanese troops on Tulagi and nearby islands were outnumbered and killed almost to the last man in the Battle of Tulagi and Govichu Tanambogo and the U.S. Marines on Guadalcanal captured an airfield under construction by the Japanese. Thus began the Guadalcanal and Solomon Islands campaigns that resulted in a series of attritional, combined arms battles between Allied and Japanese forces over the next year which, in tandem with the New Guinea campaign, eventually neutralized Japanese defenses in the South Pacific, inflicted irreparable losses on the Japanese military, especially its navy, and contributed significantly to the Allies' eventual victory over Japan. The delay in the advance of Japanese forces also allowed the Marine Corps to land on Funafuti on 2 October 1942, with a naval construction battalion building airfields on three of the atolls of Tuvalu from which a SAF B-24 Liberator bombers of the 7th Air Force operated. The atolls of Tuvalu acted as a staging post, during the preparation for the Battle of Tarawa and the Battle of Makin that commenced on 20 November 1943, which was the implementation of Operation Galvanic. Chapter 4 Section 3 – New Type of Naval Warfare The battle was the first naval engagement in history in which the participating ships never sighted or fired directly at each other. Instead, Manned aircraft acted as the offensive artillery for the ships involved. Thus, 
the respective commanders were participating in a new type of warfare, carrier versus carrier, with which neither had any experience. In H. P. Wilmot's words, the commanders had to contend with uncertain and poor communications in situations in which the area of battle had grown far beyond that prescribed by past experience but in which speeds had increased, to an even greater extent, thereby compressing decision-making time. Because of the greater speed with which decisions were required, the Japanese were at a disadvantage as Inno was too far away at Rabaul to effectively direct his naval forces in real time in contrast to Fletcher who was on scene with his carriers. The Japanese admirals involved were often slow to communicate important information to one another. Research has examined how commanders' choices affected the battle's outcome. Two studies used mathematical models to estimate the impact of various alternatives. For example, suppose the U.S. carriers had chosen to sail separately, rather than together. The models indicated the Americans would have suffered slightly less total damage, with one ship sunk but the other unharmed. However, the battle's overall outcome would have been similar. By contrast, suppose one side had located its opponent early enough to launch a first strike, so that only the opponent's survivors could have struck back. The modeling suggested striking first would have provided a decisive advantage, even more beneficial than having an extra carrier. The experienced Japanese carrier aircrews performed better than those of the U.S., achieving greater results with an equivalent number of aircraft. The Japanese attack on the U.S. carriers on 8 May was better coordinated than the U.S. attack on the Japanese carriers. The Japanese suffered much higher losses to their carrier aircrews, losing 90 aircrew killed in the battle compared with 35 for the U.S. side. Japan's cadre of highly skilled carrier air crews with which it began the war were, in effect, irreplaceable because of an institutionalized limitation in its training programs and the absence of a pool of experienced reserves or advanced training programs for new airmen. Coral Sea started a trend which resulted in the irreparable attrition of Japan's veteran carrier air crews by the end of October 1942. The U.S. did not perform as expected but it learned from its mistakes in the battle and made improvements to its carrier tactics and equipment, including fighter tactics, strike coordination, torpedo bombers and defensive strategies, such as anti-aircraft artillery, which contributed to better results in later battles. Radar gave the U.S. a limited advantage in this battle, but its value to the U.S. Navy increased over time as the technology improved and the Allies learned how to employ it more effectively. Following the loss of Lexington, improved methods for containing aviation fuel and better damage control procedures were implemented by the U.S. coordination between the Allied land-based air forces and the U.S. Navy was poor during this battle, but this too would improve over time. Japanese and U.S. carriers faced off against each other again in the battles of Midway, the Eastern Solomons, and the Santa Cruz Islands in 1942, and the Philippine Sea in 1944. Each of these battles was strategically significant, to varying degrees, in deciding the course and ultimate outcome of the Pacific War. Chapter 5, Films Battle of the Coral Sea Chapter 6, Documentaries Crusade in the Pacific, Episode 5, The Navy Holds, 1942 a segment of an episode from a TV documentary series aired originally in 1951 and made from the theatrical releases of Movie Tone News in 1942. War in the Pacific, Part 1, The Pacific in Eruption, an episode from another documentary but made from the same Movie Tone News newsreels of 1942. Also available in DVD format. Battle of the Coral Sea, Lest We Forget, online documentary released in 2010. Chapter 6, Section 1, Print Chapter 6, Section 2, Online